Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together verse by verse in the epistle to Philemon. I'd like to begin by reading a passage from Ephesians, uh, chapter 1, beginning verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein Listen, He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in Him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So ends the reading of his word. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we're thankful, so very thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that is ours to stand in your presence through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we approach your word, may the Holy Spirit open its truth to us May we recognize that we are studying the infinite Word of the Sovereign God. Make our hearts ready to receive that which is truth. May He also filter out that which is error, but seal to our hearts that which is true, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We have begun to look in at Philemon verse by verse. We were slightly interrupted uh, because of some Wednesday videos, but we're back in Philemon. It's the letter to Philemon. It's been preached in a thousand sermons that a slave named Onesimus fled from his master Philemon. I don't think it's uh, putting too much into the text to suggest that the both of them may have in fact offended one another in some way. 
uh, possibly on numerous occasions. Some people just don't get along. We have been accepted in the beloved, says Ephesians. The Holy Spirit led Paul and Onesimus to meet in Rome while Paul was in prison. Onesimus uh, apparently was led to the Lord by the Holy Spirit and is sent back to his master Philemon. I think that we need to understand as we continue that in the time sequence in the epistle, Philemon had every right to do with Onesimus whatever he wanted to do. The penalty was death. And so... Onesimus was an individual over whose head hung a death sentence. And the only thing that he could reasonably expect would be to put, be put to death. What went on in Onesimus' mind while he traveled back to his master Philemon, I have no idea. I've suggested to you that we don't want to miss that overall message, but we want to see its application. I began by looking at the first two to three verses. The only one of the letters that the Holy Spirit used Paul to write were that he calls himself Christ's prisoner. And Timothy, our brother unto Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer, he wasn't Israel's prisoner. He was Christ's prisoner. You know, and, and one can only imagine the suffering that he must have been going through. Knowing that he belongs to Christ, only knowing that he's where Christ wants him to be. Listen to me. Where Christ has put him, only, only knowing that can he say grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And there isn't the least mention of any complaint concerning what God has led him to endure. Well, we can either look at these epistles You know, look at them as, uh, as though the primary author is Paul and we can make Paul a giant hero of the faith and, and try to decide what was going on in Paul's mind when he wrote these epistles. Or, I believe that we can take the much more scriptural approach that Paul was but a tool He was just a tool that God is showing him how great things he must suffer for Christ, and that as God's tool, Paul is writing what the Holy Spirit wants written, and that in fact the author is the Holy Spirit. And when the epistle says something, it isn't so much that Paul says it, but that the Holy Spirit is saying it. Yet we should look at Paul. We should look at him as an example. We are told in 1 Timothy chapter 1 that Paul was redeemed as a prototype for all who should hereafter believe and we can see how God did it and we can understand more of what Christ meant when He said, No man can come unto Me except My Father which is in heaven drags him. We can begin to get a glimpse of the absolute perseverance and the eternal security of the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ says, All who come unto Me, I will in no wise cast out. That's John chapter 12 and realize that it's the same Lord Jesus Christ who six chapters before said, no man 
can come unto me except my Father which is in heaven drags him. Chosen and not cast out. Elect, but not cast out. In no way cast out. Not, some, not that some decide to believe and others do not. That doesn't fit Paul's prototype. Now we can think Paul had other options than to become a suffering saint. Or we can see the sovereign majesty of God at work in Paul's life. You can see the New Testament highlight of the 65th Psalm. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causes to come unto me. No man can come except the Father drags him. And if the Father drags him, well, do you suppose he comes? Well, absolutely. And he will in no wise cast him out. And so there isn't near the invitation in the verses as there is the implicit peace and confidence that we as believers in Him are secure in Him. Such was an essence. And it's the Holy Spirit who is telling us that Paul is Christ's prisoner. It is the, it is the Holy Spirit that tells us Paul is right where God intended him to be in the circumstances in which He intended to place him. And in those circumstances, it's in them circumstances that the Holy Spirit through this apostle says, grace to you and peace. And that, of course, should be the constant, that should be the, the constant awareness of everyone who is a new creation in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace. There isn't any single reason one could advance that there shouldn't be peace in your life regardless of the circumstances. Either, Dearly beloved, either the God that you worship is God indeed or He is no God at all. Grace and peace. Every hour of your life is a life filled with the grace of God. And every moment dearly beloved, ought to be shored up with the realization that you have peace with God. You're not in conflict with God. And more than that, God is not in conflict with you. Grace and peace. And it comes from God, our Father. Not from men. Not from government. Not from your own investments or your own attempts or your own activities, but from God who is our Heavenly Father. He's more than God. He's more than our God. He is our Father. It ought to be implicit in hundreds of passages of Scripture that the child does not work in synergism with his parents to be born. God is my Father. Well, what kind of a father is He? Well, as I talk to Christians today, it seems to, be, to me that most Christians feel that really, God isn't really all that great a Father. You know, that if they were the Father, they'd do a better job and things wouldn't be so bad. Things wouldn't be that the way that they are. God says He doesn't change. God says that He works all things together for your good. Now, if that be true, I should say since that be true, and people by the thousands quote that verse, tell me, what thing would you want changed if all things are working together for your good? If you changed one single one of those things, it would be something that isn't for your good. Grace and peace from God our Father. 
no matter what you're going through. He's our Father. And grace and peace from the Lord Jesus Christ. By ever, however much we reduce the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we reduce the greatness of His work. He says that we are complete in Him. I, I can't imagine any statement that should bring more peace and rest and joy than the fact that God Almighty declared that through Jesus Christ, you are complete in Him. We go on to verse 4. Thanking thee always in my worship or in my prayers. And, and, I, and I ask that you keep in mind who Paul is addressing here and that the Holy Spirit is absolutely consistent in the sovereignty of God, in the purpose of God, in the planting of God, in the harvest of God our prayers for one another, and our worship, which is really kind of hard to separate the two, must take into account the finished work of Christ and the work of God in our lives. And the more that we exalt Paul, the less we understand the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The author of this book, dearly beloved, is God Almighty. Not Paul, who just merely held the pen, who says, I thank God making mention of thee always in my prayers. This is the Holy Spirit writing this. And my mind immediately jumps back to the epistle to the Romans where that the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with, with groanings which cannot be uttered. I, I'm in no way trying to diminish prayer. What a wonderful privilege it is to communicate with God. If prayer is communication with God, it ought to be a two-way uh, two street. It's, it's almost impossible for me to pray without Scripture because He talks to me through His Word. If the Holy Spirit is not the author, Well, and to be honest with you, folks, just to tell you straight up, I mean, if he's not the author, then I've got better things to do than what I'm doing. If this is only the words of men, and, there, and there's a lot of those, and I'm not skilled enough to know whose words I should choose to follow, but I believe that all Scripture is God-breathed and the Holy Spirit says the Holy Spirit says that He is constantly bringing my name up before the throne. Okay? And yours. And sin dogs my every step and Satan tries to harass me. There's the Holy Spirit and my name is always before God with groanings which cannot be uttered. I am not suggesting that Paul is not praying for Philemon. I believe in Paul's worship and in his communication with God, he brings up Philemon's name. But dearly beloved, if you pass the verse without realizing that the Holy Spirit is constantly bringing your name up, that He's always making intercession for you before the throne of God, then you've missed a marvelous truth in the passage. Now suppose that, that you were Philemon, and suppose you also had the spiritual insight to realize that these words are God-breathed. And that the Holy Spirit is saying that He is always making mention of you in His communication with the Heavenly Father. 
The Holy Spirit is not less than God. That's why I said a few moments ago, I believe verse 4 is spoken by God Almighty, for I believe the Holy Spirit to be God Almighty. But here I am looking at the infinite, sovereign, majestic God of, of all eternity through the aspect of the Holy Spirit who is making intercession for me with groanings which can't be uttered. Cannot be uttered. Don't you believe that somehow it, it ought to enter into the mind of Philemon that the Holy Spirit is doing this also for Onesimus? I think it's wonderful to know that I am in the intercessory prayers and the work of the Holy Spirit. But so are you. Dearly beloved, I don't know what God is doing in your life. I do not know where you are in His plan and purpose for your life. I don't know the state of His dealings with you. I've spent my life trying not to judge. I look at actions but I, I wouldn't judge an individual. I don't know where you are in God's program. But I do know this. I know that you are right where God wants you to be. If you're His child. I know that God is working in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. And the day will come. It will when you will stand before Him face to face. What a marvelous prospect to stand there realizing that Jesus paid it all, that I've never been out of His plan and never been out of His program, never, never been out of His care. He's always sustained and upheld me. And not only is that true of me, it's true of you. The verse not only makes it impossible, impossible for Philemon to criticize Onesimus, it makes it impossible for me to criticize you in this human frame. I don't know where he is in dealing with your life. I, I see him deal with Rahab and Tamar and Solomon and David. Samuel, I see him say to Josiah that because you turned to me with your whole heart, I'll take you home in peace. And then I see Josiah shot in war and killed. You know, and I think God must be telling me something about going home in peace. It doesn't have anything to do with man's peace, but with God's. And when God drew me to Him, when God dragged me to Him, He'll take me home in peace. I am not going to arrive on heaven's shore in conflict with God, and God isn't going to be in conflict with me. And it staggers me as I talk to Christians how many seem to think that there's going to be some animosity and some scores that have to be settled before they're in fellowship and communion with God throughout eternity. As though Jesus Christ did not do enough. We come up with some kind of Christian purgatory when He took Josiah home in peace. Not so in the case of Jezebel or Cain or Judas. I don't, I, I don't have very many that, that I know for certain, but I do have a few. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That applies to you 
And that applies to me. That applies to every one of God's children. The text is not addressing unredeemed individuals here, okay? They won't listen to Moses and the prophets. They won't listen to one as though he rose from the dead. That was surely prophetic for they didn't listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he without question rose from the dead. hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Verse 5. Now, if we believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, well, we have an interesting fifth verse. Surely Paul must have heard about this in prison in Rome. You know, one wonders, you know, did he hear about it from Onesimus? I'm not sure a Christian master ought to be a, a super master, right? You know, if that be true, why would Onesimus run away? Of all, of all the people who were citizens of Rome, who could own slaves, it would seem as though the Christian would be the best owner of a slave. And if the slave had any choice, which of course he didn't, but if he had it, some choice in the matter, he'd surely want a Christian master. Why did Onesimus flee from Philemon? No, I don't know. I don't know. Should I spend a, an entire sermon surmising on something that the Holy Spirit never mentions? You know, it might be a fun exercise, I guess, in the imaginations of our brain. Uh, or late night study, but I, I don't think that we should go beyond the scriptures. I don't know why he left. You know, maybe Philemon was perfect and Onesimus just didn't like perfection. I don't know. But he did run away. Obviously, Paul heard something about Philemon while he was in prison in Rome. I'd suggest that he heard it from the elders and, and the people at the church at Colossae more than he heard it from Onesimus. But I, I don't know. But what about the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit saying here? Huh? I'm going to ask you to at least think about one possibility. Doesn't verse 5 right here, doesn't verse 5 say that God Almighty isn't looking at the activities of the old man? I believe and I have for many, many years that there is a powerful comforting truth in the fifth verse that many people have never seen. And that is that God Almighty is not dwelling on the activities of the flesh. Okay? Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, and so on and so on and so on. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace. Now that's in the fifth chapter of Galatians. In a chapter that deals with the unending conflict between flesh and spirit. Christians have for centuries spoken of the old nature and the new nature. And, and I, I'm not certain I like those words. I'm not... Well, I'm not certain I dislike those words, but I, I feel like I'm a, on a little bit more solid ground when I speak of the old man and the new man. Having put off the old man and, and put on the new man. And suddenly I see the Holy Spirit 
saying that the only thing, the only thing that he hears about is my love and faithfulness. Faithfulness. The word faith there ought to be translated faithfulness. I think that I can say to the Lord with all of my heart, I wish that everything, every thought, every motive, every action in my life was in the sphere of the new man, but it isn't from my poor vantage point. It, it seems to me that in fact the reverse is true. Most of it is in the sphere of the old man. Dearly beloved, there is not one of you out there that isn't doing a good job of sinning. I want you to understand that all the Father hears about, all Paul hears about, all that Philemon and even Onesimus hears about, because I'm, I'm sure that it's just as true of Onesimus, all you and I hear about is love and faithfulness. It is toward the Lord Jesus Christ and toward all the saints. And I believe that's proper because I believe it is only possible to direct, to, to assign that love and, and faithfulness toward the saints to the new creation in Christ Jesus, which has no ability, none whatsoever to sin because it's been born of God. Dearly beloved, we know that with the fall of Adam, we obtain the ability to sin. And, and yet we read in 1 John chapter 3 that whosoever is born of God does not commit sin because his seed abides in him and he has no ability to sin. God does not begat sinful children, folk. That's why you were made a new creation in Christ Jesus. It's true that with the fall of Adam, I obtained the ability to sin, but with the vicarious suffering, death, and resurrection of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in my place, the new creation has no ability to sin. And here the Holy Spirit says, all I hear about, all I hear about is your love and faithfulness. Dearly beloved, rest in Him. Rest in Him. For after He has tested us, we shall come forth as gold. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.